So why don't we start with uh, Sarah? You're in your my upper left hand corner. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Mancuso. I'm a regional director for Harvest Properties. We're a commercial property owner and manager in the Bay Area. Um, we own and or manage a handful of buildings in downtown San Jose to include 225 West Santa Clara, 60 South Market, and um, the Towers at Second project, which is where we work, is at. Um, so I'm excited to be a part of the board. I also sit on the PBID board for the San Jose Downtown Association. Thank you. David? Unmute. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. Hi. Oh, oh, oh wait. Two Davids. <laughs> yeah, I was David just, Tran, sorry, go David ahead. Tran. <laughs> go ahead. No, I'm not a board member, so you go on, David. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we use less names, huh? There. Um, my name's David Heindel. I, uh, among other things, uh, own a small business in downtown San Jose uh, across from the Chase Bank called Hotworks. It's an infrared health facility. Everyone's welcome to come and try us out sometime. Uh, I came to your meeting last March and uh, observed... Uh, at that one and thought that maybe a perspective of somebody who's uh, operating a 24 hour, uh, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year business might be able to contribute something um, to this board. I'm glad it only meets four times a year. Um, I'm sure you are too. And uh, in my background is uh, almost 50 years in real estate and development, both public and private. The most part that's probably most interesting, relevant here is I spent some time at the San Jose Redevelopment Agency 20 years ago. And I like to tell my old friends at City Hall that I'm probably the only person that's ever completely read the amended and restated San Antonio Redevelopment Agency uh, document. That's it. Well, welcome. Thank you both. Uh, maybe just going around real quick, I'll call off your names. We can give your two seconds just to introduce yourselves to Sarah and David as they're both new. Uh, Laura Wells? Oh, hi. Um, hi, Laura Wells. Um, I am the assistant director in the Department of Transportation and have been with the city for quite some time. Um, and in parking, probably going back to for at least 30 years involved in some fashion. So um, look, look forward to, um, you know, being in future meetings with you all. And thank you for, for joining the, the board. Tamika? Hi, uh, my name is Tomiko. Um, I'm the president of the Japantown Business Association, but that's volunteer gig. Um, I've, I'm just, my family's just a part of Japantown. Roy Station is part of the family as well. Roy's my grandfather. Um, I also have a website design company. Thank you. Henry, Gord? You're on mute, Henry. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Okay, Henry Cord just reelected as chair by forfeit. Um, <laughs> anyhow, I've been in a land land use consultant role for the last uh, 21 years. Before that, I had worked for various uh, semi-private and public firms. So I've been in real estate my entire career. And I look forward to a great meeting this morning. Thank you, Henry. Laura Stuchinsky. Hi, I'm um, Laura Stuchinsky. I'm the Emerging Mobility Program Lead for the Department of Transportation. Emerging mobility being a variety of things, including things like car sharing and scooters and automated vehicles. Thank you. Harvard? Hello, my name is Harvard Sun. I am the Chief Financial and Operations Officer at the Tech Interactive in downtown San Jose. And I think I'm on my second stint with the board. Is that right? Oh, God, I'd have to go back to the roster. 
Yeah, uh, when I start when I started, I didn't have this gray hair, and after a few years, as you can see, what happened with this board. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Elias. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm the on-street parking manager with the Department of Transportation. I have uh, uh, many years of experience in parking, including off-street. Uh, that was uh, initially my background. Welcome, everyone. Uh, David Tran. Good morning. Uh, I'm David Tran. I'm policy and legislative director with uh, council member Raul Perales, uh, who is the district three council member. He is also the, um, the city council liaison to this uh, board. And I uh, uh, generally attend on his behalf. Um, and so welcome to the new members and uh, looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Heather? Good morning. I'm Heather Hoshi with the Department of Transportation. I'm the division manager uh, responsible for parking and downtown operations. Uh, I've been with the city since 2003, originally stationed at the airport and joined DOT in 2008. Uh, welcome to all of our new members. Very excited to um, be able to round out our board and have some additional inputs and uh, am hopeful that we'll have some um, Great feed, get, get some great feedback from our new members and our continued feedback, great feedback from our existing members. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie? Welcome guys, I'm Charlie Foss. I'm the CFO uh, at San Jose State University. Uh, been, this is my fifth year over here. Uh, previously, I spent 10 years as the CFO with the Sharks. For disclosure to everybody as we talk about that occasionally. Um, and I am also the uh, nonprofit uh, chair of the San Jose Sports Authority uh, that brings in the major sporting events into the downtown and is being used for the parking facilities. Thank you. Lily? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Lily Lim South, Deputy Director over Traffic Operations and Safety. I've been with the city 28 years and um, excited to be part of the parking conversation. Thank you. Marie? Hi everyone, Brave on Faith, Managing Director at the San Jose Downtown Association. Wolfram. Yeah, I'm Wolfram Schneider. I work in high tech and I live in downtown San Jose since uh, 2000. And I'm a resident here and a representative for the residents on the parking board. Thank you. Nathan. Good morning, everybody. Feels like high school all over again. I'm picked last. I'm taking roll. Also, right there. Yeah. No, it's good. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm the Director of Policy and Operations at the San Jose Downtown Association. Good seeing some folks here, familiar faces and some new ones. Last but not least, John Risto. Um, Arianne, he's maybe... um, on probably... Hi, hi everybody. Just wanted to... Um have the chance to join you for a little bit. I'm actually on another call as well. So, but I thought I'd jump in and say hi to everybody. Uh, I'll try to get to the next meeting and in, intact, but thank you for having me here. No problem. Thanks, John. All right. Well, let's kick it off with our, our first item is the consent item, which is the approval of the, the minutes from the September meeting. Um, if I can get a motion second, and then we can quickly do the vote. Uh, obviously, Sarah and uh, David would abstain as you weren't at the meeting. Um, motion. Get a motion. Tomiko, motion. Mm -hmm. Second. Second was Harvard. Harvard. Show of hands. All in favor? One, two, three. Aye. Henry, four. All right. Thank you. And then I wanted to take a couple or one item out of order and that'd be item 7A. Laura Stuchinski is presenting for us. So I wanted her to be able to get her item off the, the docket and then she can move on. So why don't we jump into item 7A, one way shared vehicle service pilot program. Thanks. Can you see that presentation? Yes. yes. 
Great. So I'll move to this and then I'll give you an um, opportunity for discussion at the end. I'm gonna basically give you a, some sense about, um, let me back up and say that this DOT is going to council in February to establish a one-way vehicle sharing program. Specifically, we're asking for authorization to among other things, issue permits to one-way vehicle operators to park in time-limited and unmetered parking areas. And we're seeking your support for that recommendation. So in the presentation, I'm going to give you a bit of background about why we're pursuing a one-way vehicle sharing, what vehicle sharing and one-way vehicle sharing is and how it works, and how we're proposing to implement one-way vehicle sharing in San Jose, particularly in the downtown and Japantown. So you're probably all very familiar with the fact that in 2018, the City Council adopted Climate Smart, which laid out a path the city to achieve the Paris Accord greenhouse gas emissions targets. One key area of focus was transportation, which continues, which has been and continues to be the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in San Jose and California. And passenger vehicles are the single largest source of emissions within transportation. Climate Smart took a multi-pronged approach to reducing emissions from passenger vehicles, um, specifically expanding the variety of shared services and that are available in the city and accelerating transportation electrification. In particular, the city has sought to realize the combined value of these strategies to the establishment of an electric car sharing program. In January of 22, the council adopted a memo directing staff to explore options for incentivizing electric car sharing and to come back with an ordinance authorizing a one-way car sharing program. So just to step back and explain what car sharing is. And many, many of you may be already familiar with car sharing. Maybe you've seen the zip cars or driven one of them that, are, that have been parked in the downtown and greater downtown area for oh, yeah. nearly a decade. Um, but if you're not familiar with them, car sharing is similar to using the library. With a library card, you can borrow a book for a limited period of time. When you return it, the book can be checked out by somebody else. So you get the benefit of reading the book without having to buy it. With vehicle sharing, your membership allows you to rent a car from or a moped for when you get, you can rent the vehicle for a few minutes, for a few hours, or for a day. With vehicle sharing, you get the benefit of using a car or a moped without the cost to buy or maintain one. Sorry? The rental rates typically include fuel, insurance, and emergency assistance. There's two general flavors of car sharing, station-based and one-way. Zipcar offers a station-based service. All of their cars have a designated parking space. The members check out the cars, use them for as long as they like, and then return them to their designated parking space. In the one-way model, members can check out a vehicle and drive them anywhere so long as they end their reservation in the company's service area. More on that in a moment. There's two companies <clears throat> expressed interest in coming to San Jose, two one-way companies. Rebels, an electric moped sharing service, and Gig Car Share, which is owned by the California State Auto Association. Rebel started its operation in New York City in 2018 and then expanded to Washington, D.C., Miami, and Austin. It opened for business in Oakland in January of this year and more recently expanded Berkeley and San Francisco. Gig Car Share launched its first service in Oakland in 2017, then expanded to include Berkeley. Albany and Alameda, all in one contiguous service area. It also serves downtown San Francisco and one of the San Francisco neighborhoods. And last year, Gig expanded to Sacramento, and in April of this year, it began service in Seattle. Both companies indicate that they would start with a service area that would extend over approximately 10 square miles and would likely include the greater downtown. This is Revel's concept of initial service area. For one-way vehicle sharing services to be successful, vehicles need to be easily accessed by potential users. Revel's goal is to have a moped within a five-minute walk. To achieve this, the company said it would likely launch its service with 100 mopeds. Gig is considering 250 cars. But finding the vehicle is only half the equation. For the service to be useful, you need to be able to park it where you want to go. And that could be in time-limited or metered parking areas or in residential permit parking zones. Cities typically issue permits to allow one-way vehicles to park in these otherwise prohibited areas. For example, Oakland allows shared vehicles to park in metered and unmetered time-limited zones that are two hours or longer for up to 72 hours. That's the state limit. 
The, the company pays the meter fee as long as its vehicles are parked in the metered space. Prior to the pandemic, few of gigs vehicles in, in Oakland sat unused for more than 72 hours. The average turnover rate was less than two hours. In recent months during the COVID, um, the average has risen to five and a half hours in Oakland and four hours across gigs for city East Bay service area, which is still far less than the maximum. <clears throat> High turnover rates are as important to the companies as it is to cities because it's fundamental to their survival. If the vehicles sit too long, companies discount their rates to incentivize users to move the vehicles or deploy staff to reposition them. Under California Motor Vehicle Code, cities have the authority to designate certain streets or portions of streets for the exclusive or non-exclusive use of shared vehicles. Under state law, motor vehicles includes cars and mopeds. Through the, to the city's master parking rate resolution, DOT is already authorized to issue permits to car share services seeking dedicated parking spaces, such as Zipcar. Thus far, Zipcar has been the only car share provider that's made use of this provision. With this proposal, the city is seeking council authority to approve service areas for one-way service operators. These would be non-exclusive parking areas. We're also seeking approval to modify the city's muni code to permit these operators to park in otherwise restricted areas such as time-limited metered and unmetered parking zones and RPP zones with conditions. These are the specific actions we are asking council to take. To authorize the director or their designee to establish non-exclusive service areas for one-way service operators. To issue permits to allow one-way vehicles to park in otherwise restricted areas for up to 72 hours to require permittees to provide GPS data on the location of their vehicles, to allow the city to confirm how much the company owes the city in meter fees, as well as its turnover rates, to establish terms and conditions of the permit, including the ability to set lower maximum times. On the last point, I wanted to elaborate that, that DOT staff has spoken to the Downtown Association staff and to Japantown Association, Tomiko, uh, piloting the service for six months with a 24-hour limit and using that period to gather data about how quickly the vehicles turn over, where they linger, and the overall value of the service. This would allow the city the time to develop mutually beneficial permanent permit terms in consultation with the city's business districts and permittee. The thought we'd, we had in conversation with both Tomiko and with the Downtown Association was, this might be a good time to test, the, test this kind of a service, given with, with under the pandemic, there's less demand for parking right now. Uh, these terms could include parking prohibitions for select streets or portions of streets. The process I just learned works fine for car sharing, but the situation is a bit different for parking shared mopeds. In many urban U.S. cities, motorcycles and mopeds are allowed to park perpendicular to the curb between parking spaces. This is not the norm in San Jose. Parking mopeds in metered spaces designated for full-size cars would be cost prohibitive for the operators and also likely generate, generate strong pushback from motorists in areas where parking is high demand. Consequently, staff is taking a different approach to parking shared mopeds in metered districts. Do you do plans to repurpose curb, red curb areas within the city's metered districts that are too small for a car, but could be safely occupied by a few mopeds? In July, the city installed a combined bike scooter corral in downtown South 1st Street, 2nd, 2nd Street at East William Street. Staff is identifying other promising locations for moped corrals in Japantown and downtown. The corrals would augment the city's motorcycle parking spaces, which are available at no cost to motorcycles and mopeds. The parking corrals will be per permitted under the existing permit for exclusive parking spaces for car sharing. DOT is also looking at making some rate changes and adopting fees for one-way permits. Currently, the fees listed in the master parking rate resolution for dedicated parking is $100 per month per car share vehicle per space in downtown and $50 per month per, for parking elsewhere in the city. Their meter rates were recently changed. They are the same everywhere. So we'd like to take this opportunity to apply that policy to reserved car share parking spaces. Consistent with council direction, we also want to revise the fees to create an incentive for electric vehicles, either to reduce the fee for, uh, for EVs 
or increase the rate for conventional cars. And we'd welcome your thoughts on that. For one way, we're in the process of developing fees for these permits. The permit for parking in time limited and metered zones would be an estimate of the meter revenue the company will be responsible for, which would be reconciled either every quarter or annually. There also may be a small administrative fee associated with the permit. Staff is developing a similar proposal for the residential par permit parking permit. Both would need to be approved by the city's budget office. That's the conclusion of my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions you might have or if there's any further information you'd like. Happy to try to answer them. Yeah, I have a question. This is Wolfram. I have a question. So there's one service for the mopeds and the other one is for the car. Right. right? There's two different operators offering similar services, ones with mopeds and ones with cars, correct? But they are not mixing, so you not have one service which offers both. It's either or. Currently, there's only a com one company that offers one and another company that offers the other. There's no company currently that I'm aware of that offers both. Okay, thank you. Laura, what's the... You know, lots of articles in New York about the safety of these mopeds uh, and just how unsafe they are. Um, so one, that's pretty scary. Uh, and then two, what's the demographics of people that are riding these mopeds versus, you know, the scooters that we have all over uh, the place here? Um, I, to me, I see it as the same demographics. You know, you don't have a whole lot of room on a scooter to put a bag of groceries, right, safely. Uh, same as you don't on a, on a scooter. So to me, I think you're going after the same demographic two ways. And the last thing I believe we need is more clutter on our streets. Um, the demographic, my understanding, is fairly young. 20 to 40 is the majority and more male than female. Although the companies, this is actually for the mopeds specifically. The cars, I think, are pretty much wider in terms of <laughs> Age usage. Yeah, this is a moped question. It's not a car. This is a car thing we do at San Jose State. I'm a fan of, and it's the right, right. thing to do, right. uh, in my opinion. But it's, it's um, the mopeds that I think are uh, a step too far. And I, we see what happens with mopeds, excuse me, with scooters on sidewalks already. We see that they're littered around. Um, I don't know why we would want to open the door to more of this crap to be put on our city streets. Um, to make one clarification, we did hear a lot of concerns about the scooters when we started talking about the mopeds. Mopeds are considered a motor vehicle. They cannot park on the sidewalk. They're a car. They're considered in the same class of a car. So although I appreciate- scooters are as well, and they have to be in the bike lanes, but that hasn't stopped anyone from putting them on the sidewalk. Uh, Laura, the map that you showed um, that showed the proposed boundary. How does that work? Do, do they have to, do the vehicles or mopeds stay within that area or is that just where they have to start and end up? Where they have to start and end up. But they can go outside the area and come back? Correct. Okay. Correct. So I had a question. Sorry. I had a question about um, the exclusive parking space fee that you were planning to charge. How, what, would, what is that based on? Sorry, what is it based on? Yeah, the hundred dollar a month. Um, what would that? What what metric did you use to get that number? Actually, I, I will, I'll let the parking folks who are expert on this. But my understanding is it's based on the the, the meter revenue fees and what a day's uh, revenue would be. But it's been discounted as well. Laura, do you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, so my recollection is that, you know, the city want, you know, because the city wants to encourage these uses of alternate mobility, um, when that was established, it was based on 50% of what the parking space it would be expected to bring in in normal times in, in regular revenue. So, so that was the rationale. Um, and oh. I believe that carried forward to the garages as well. Okay. So there's because uh, if I calculate the date, the, the rate of $2 an hour times eight hours a day times six uh, times four, 
you know, four weeks in a, a month, that ends up being almost $400. So I don't know if I'm guessing that right or, or figuring that out because it seems more like that $100 number is a quarter of what you could theoretically get of 100% occupancy. It, so it was based on what we were realizing an average meter revenue. And, and downtown, Heather, correct me, it was about $8 a day. That's correct. Unfortunately, they're not occupied the entire time. As much as we'd like to collect that revenue, it'd be great. But yeah, they're not. Uh, it's an average across the entire kind of downtown. Um, and there's definitely areas that have higher occupancy than others. And so we kind of average it out. It's about the same. And it's in line with when we have tow away permits where people uh, request to tow uh, to close out a, a metered space for a time period. That's about the same thing we charge them as about $8 a day. Cool. Okay. Thank you for answering that. And and can I just point out to to piggyback on that just a little bit is in this particular case. Correct me if I'm wrong, Laura. We're looking at spaces, especially for the mopeds, that aren't currently metered. They're not usable spaces at this point. So there's probably a further potential discount there because we're not we're not losing any revenue by designating those spaces. There's not any foregone revenue there. Yeah, correct. I, uh, yeah, I was working with Laura on proper placement of the corral so that they're in, you know, safe red zones. So I have a question too. When it comes to both the mopeds and the cars, are they electric or are they gasoline driven? And, if they, and if they are electrical, then of course you would need charging stations wherever you park them. So how are you dealing with the charging of these vehicles? Good question, thank you. Um, the mopeds are electric and the company, there's a battery pack that they replace. So the companies will come out and find the batteries, find the, find the mopeds and replace them out in the field. Um, the cars that Gig is using right now are all hybrid except for their Sacramento location. We were not able to figure out how to incentivize the companies to switch to electric just yet because the costs are still too high. We hope in time we'll figure out a way to, to make that happen. Okay, thank you. Sure. I have a two part question, Laura. Um, did Revel or Gig provide any information about the potential demand for these vehicles in the downtown area or within the 10 mile radius? Do we have any idea of the likely usage of these? And then I guess the second part to my question is if the demand is greater or less than what is put forth in this document, what is the mechanism for increasing or decreasing the number of cars that are on the streets and, and any parking spaces that would be provided or areas that would be provided, I guess, for parking? Great, those are good questions. Um, they haven't given us numbers on, on projected demand. They, they were, I think, anticipating that the service would be as popular as it was showing to be in Oakland before the pandemic hit. Um, they have since operated in San Francisco and San Francisco previously had a moped service that closed in the early part of the pandemic and the take up rate has been very good. Unfortunately, it, it is not working as strong right now in Berkeley and Oakland, um, which is why the, um, the company Rebel was eager to come now, but they've, they're waiting a little bit longer to see if as the, to time their arrival when more business starts to pick up again in the city. Um, but they are like the city concerned about having too many vehicles in a location if they're not being used. So they're, they're eager to come and during the pandemic, maybe the recovery start to wave to start to see if this could be a useful option for people who don't have a car, don't want a car, want to reduce their costs. And there's certainly a lot of need for that. Um, but um, also, um, time it, so that the, there's interest in using the vehicles because um, they can't afford to have the cars or the vehicles sit too for too long. Um, so part of it would be an experiment on their side to see, to find the right timing and the right location and the right number. And they also started in Oakland, again, this is pre-pandemic, with way more vehicle, more way more mopeds then the area could accommodate, can really use, and they quickly realized they had oversized and reduced the number of mopeds. So they're, they're always looking, even during good times, to figure out what's the right number, what's the right size, because they have to manage however whatever size district they create. 
I have another question, which is going uh, a little bit uh, along with what Charlie was uh, concerned about. So they are com we're talking about the mopeds. They are competing right now with uh, the scooters. So there are mopeds which you can just ride alone, and there are other mopeds which you can ride uh, two uh, people on it. And also, you know, some may have, you know, some kind of like a little basket in, in the back for, for groceries and stuff. So what is the, how do the scooters look like? Are they able to be ridden by two people? And again, you know, can you transport also kind of, you know, groceries uh, in an easier way than on a scooter? Yes, actually, they're, thank you, another good question. They're considered actually more comparable or more competitive with electric bikes. Scooters, most people think of them as being something you would take for a mile or two because they're not that comfortable for longer distances. An electric bike, you might take for five miles or seven miles. This you might even take up for 20 miles because it's much more comfortable a ride. Um, it does have a seat for two. It also keeps helmets in the back cabinet for two. And I believe that that unit can also be used to, to carry equipment. So it's, it's a more comfortable ride for a wider range of than applications. Okay, and another uh, question, totally different. So you said, you know, there are, you know, some of the Bay Area cities which use them. Did the city of San Jose reach out to them to get, you know, their opinion about the usage and, uh, you know, what uh, hurdles or what issues there may arise uh, for San Jose? Yes, we, we've talked to San Francisco and also talked to Oakland extensively. And uh, they, San Francisco was a little more restrictive when the company started to first come in and, um, do mopeds, but they found that they were so well received and that they weren't taking as much space as they originally thought. So they um, uh, made their rules much more re um, relaxed to allow them to be used in more locations. Um, and Oakland, again, pre-pandemic was also seeing really good usage um, and was very, they were finding that some people were moving over from the car share to the mopeds because they found them more flexible more opportunities for parks in them and smaller, tighter spaces, particularly that's true in San Francisco. Um, so yes, that both cities found that they were very pleased with the service and pleased with the company Revel as a responsible operator to work with. Can I ask a quick question? Um, two part, I guess. Uh, the elevator pitch for this is we've got red spaces, we can generate revenue. Isn't that wonderful? And the second part is um, that we um, uh, we're going to provide another alternative for people who, I guess, live or come to downtown to be able to get around. And that's good for greenhouse gases and other reasons. And then the third pitch is it's a pilot program. If we don't like it, we get rid of it. Is that accurate? If not, and then the last question is, how much money do we think we're going to make? Um, well, from the DOT's perspective, the, the second one about giving expanded alternatives is definitely a driving factor and also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Both are very high priorities for the city and for the department in terms of meeting the needs of more people to get around, particularly with public transit having such a hard time right now. Um, yes, it's, it's a pilot program. The idea is to try to figure out the terms and conditions, knowing that we the city doesn't have an experience with a one-way program. We have lots with two-way, but this is a very different kind of service. It could be a real advantage. It help, could get more people to come to the downtown who, who have by other means and ways that are compatible with other things going in the downtown, or it could be very problematic. So yes, we're proposing it as a pilot term so we can figure out, are there ways that we could make this work for, for all parties, the users, the company, the downtown association, downtown businesses, and we won't know until we do it. And that's why we're proposing the pilot as a way to all of us to get experience and figure out what's a way to do that well. Um, yes, it's nice to be able to see that we could use red curb spaces in ways that otherwise would not have been useful for cars, but could open up some more opportunities. I don't, I wasn't, I haven't figured out what the revenue would be for that. Um, and I don't know how many spaces we'd be using, but yes, it would be another source of funding um, someone from the downtown association had also suggested that if a car is sitting there for a while and it's not being used by anybody else and this company is going to pay for the revenue when we're not getting parking revenue in, that could be another temporary win as well. I mean, 
hopefully over time, we're figuring out how to get the cars to turn over or in the right spaces, if they're gonna be lingering so that it's not taking up valuable space. But in the short term, that could be a means of bringing in a bit more revenue to the parking fund. So following up on David's question, Laura, how much money uh, has the city made on the Ford bikes or uh, any of the scooter uh, arrangements that they have? Um, I don't know. It's not my program. There's another person who runs it. It's been mostly run as a revenue neutral program. So we're, we're covering our costs. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of the point. It, the data it, platform. Let, let's take that off to the side because there really isn't a money-making opportunity. Right, 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 you know, right. Maybe and, it fits into what David's saying about it being a greener way to get around town, but you don't get much greener uh, than the scooters. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the uh, mopeds are much more dangerous. And frankly, I'm not sure you're saying they can go 20 miles, but they can't go 20 miles outside of the map that you put there, um, unless they I guess they return back uh, in here and that kind of defeats the purpose. Right. Hey, Laura, um, um, I'm not sure what the review process is on this, but does something like a program like this have to get run through some type of legal review or risk management yeah. review? And yes, the certainty assuming... and the risk management department will definitely issue requirements for the city to be covered. So it's, it's protected, um, which is true in every city that these companies have operated in, whether it's car show or, or motorcycle. Mm -hmm. They, companies also provide a third party liability insurance to users of their service so that there is an insurance covering folks who are using whether they have their own or they don't have their own insurance. Um, and one other point I might make about the scooters, which might be helpful in thinking this through, is that we are the number of scooter companies and the number of scooters that are currently available in the city has shrunk considerably. And it's not clear yet whether post covert or even over the long term, whether that model financially will work um, for sustainable programs. So if, if it's around, it's great to have more, more options, more services. It's not clear yet whether even after COVID that model will sustain. Yeah. Laura, um, going back to mm -hmm. Charlie's good question on, on the Ford bikes and the revenue, um, my understanding is that the permit fee that is issued to the Ford bikes is solely cost recovery. It's right. just associated with the cost of issuing the permit and managing the program. It's not, there's no revenue generation aspects with that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I have also an, an additional question here. And this is going back to, you know, it's a one way uh, rental. So if I want to drop it off, do I need to drop off anything, the moped or the car in a designated spot or can I drop it off wherever I want? Wherever you want, it to be a legal parking space, but whatever you want, unless the area has been restricted. For example, if it's a residential parking permit zone and they, that area has not opted into the program that you would not be able to park there. Okay, but I could drop it off at, let's say, you know, in, at a metered parking space or in a parking garage of the city. Correct. Um, I don't know about the garages, um, but yes, you would be able to park it on the street in any legal parking space. And the company would be responsible for the parking fee in this case. Correct. So the thought is, for example, with one way, you're going to Deer Don Station, you're going to take the train, you're going on an outing, or you're going to commute, you can end your reservation there. And otherwise, if you had a round trip service, you'd have to pay for it the whole time it was parked, so it would be there when you got back. Whereas one way, you end your reservation, and then you go on the next part of your journey, and that vehicle might be used by someone else four or five times before you come back and then find another one to get home. Okay. And uh, that's more a question for Arian. Can you share the presentation with the board members? Absolutely. Thank you. Just to, uh, um, Laura, to pick, sorry, to piggyback on Wolfram's question there, can you give a little insight into exactly how the companies restrict certain areas? So if the city says, okay, you can't, you can't leave the vehicle in an RPP zone, or for example, in the downtown, we don't want them dropped in freight loading zones and left. 
How does the company ensure that that doesn't happen? There's two mechanisms for preventing cars from going where we don't want them to go. One of them is they can geofence off areas. So that say they, they can't go in an RPP zone. They can't end their reservation in an RPP zone. Doesn't mean they can't drive into it. They can't, they can't drive through it or on the street, but they can't end their reservation in that area. Um, and the same thing would be true if we decided that say one street in the downtown is clearly getting too many cars of uh, these shared vehicles parking and then lingering too long, which is making a problem that we could geofence that, fence, that street off and say, you can't park there. You can park in other areas. Um, the other means that if, if someone is violating the rules, um, the city's rules or the company's rules, the company itself can impose consequences and eventually can, if the person is violating the rules repeatedly, they can suspend their membership. Uh, Charlie, to your, I had the exact same concerns when I when I met with Laura initially. It was right after the two deaths in New York City when they they stopped, uh, implement they stopped uh, the moped program temporarily. And uh, you know I understand that this is uh, you know a pilot program, so theoretically it can be shut down if it doesn't work out. To its benefit, I think that um, you know while traffic is and uh, is lower during the pandemic now might be a good time to try something out because I think it would be a bumpy ride regardless. So my question to Laura is like, how soon do you see this theoretically kicking off in in the city? That's a good question. I unfortunately don't have a firm answer. Um, the, the companies I mentioned, this is Revel in particular, was expressing interest in coming now um, because you're seeing how low the usage is relative to where it was before in Oakland and Berkeley, they and they figure that we're more similar to Oakland and Berkeley than San Francisco, they're mm -hmm. going to wait a few months. So maybe it'll be March, April, but I don't know. It, it depends on how well, if we start to see some more e economic activity, then they'll think that, okay, maybe we're ready. And part of it is they're going to asking us to keep an, an eye on things and give them a sense about when we think that the, the situation is right. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, thank you, Tamika, for, for bringing up the issue about New York City. The company was suspended from operating in New York City for a couple months because there were a couple deaths in that city. They were caused not by the vehicle, but by the operators. And But the company took responsibility and the city also required them to re-examine their safety requirements and they have upped their safety and training requirements. Now you have to take a picture of yourself wearing a helmet on before you can proceed with your your res your, your um, reservation or operate the vehicle. Um, and if you're seen um, not wearing your mo mo your helmet. If you're if we, they identify that you're not wearing a helmet when you're riding, you can have your membership taken away from you. There's also a much more extensive training program and testing program to make sure people are understanding the safety requirements necessary with operating these vehicles. Or I, I guess my bottom line last question on this thing: How do you put that fence up so that on my campus? people aren't driving 30 miles an hour with these mopeds. And if, because it doesn't work with scooters, all right? And they're going 14 now down to seven or eight or whatever it might be. And people are whipping through the campus still to this day. And we're upping that up to 30 miles an hour. Mm. And hopefully we get our students back here at some point next fall. You know, this is a massive recipe for disaster. Yeah having people whipping around on the campus. And, and that's where I see this going. You're targeting my students, right? The demographic is San Jose State students. And if they live in one corner and they're trying to get to the other side, which is the downtown, and that's the most likely path that they would go, or, or it's just people in general going through the campus, my, my police department isn't gonna be out there giving tickets out to uh, people, right? this thing has to be locked down. And mm -hmm. I just see this as a massive safety hazard, not just for the people riding it, but for the people on the sidewalks when these right. things are on the sidewalks. Right. I think that Revo would be very sympathetic to that view. Un un unfortunately, a lot of the communications we've had with the scooter companies is they were not very responsible operators. It's in Revo's interest to make sure that they're their users are not doing dangerous things because they know that that will undermine their ability to operate in the city. So um, from what I've heard from other cities, Revel is much more responsible and easy to work with. It's in their interest to not have people violate the rules, drive through campus and cause the kind of problem they had in New York City. 
all the other guys said the same thing when they were coming in with Uber and Lyft and we're going to be the good guys. We're not going to be the bad guys. And they're the, all just, Yeah, but this is city saying that of the company as opposed to the company saying it of itself. So, so lots of lots of good discussion with the board. I, I know you have a, a full agenda. Um, you know, staff, we were directed by council to come back with the one way um, vehicle share program. Um, and, you know, Laura Stuchinski is here um, to get the board support for the program as, as she described. You know, I don't know, Arian, does the board take a vote on it? Does the board? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the intent was to allow Laura to go to council, you know, at the next phase would have the recommendation or not of the downtown parking board, or at least their position on, on the item to include in the council memo. And so um, I think the ask is, is there a motion, if not, you know, we'll, we'll document it. I'll make a motion. Uh, I, I move to approve zip cars uh, and go down that path of exploring a partnership on the zip cars, uh, but not to have a partnership on the mopeds. So that would be a loud gig, but not the rebel scooters. Yeah, I personally disagree a little bit with that. I think we should pursue both roads I think the mopeds could be, you know, something uh, beneficial for uh, our downtown. But I also understand, you know, the, the kind of concerns Charlie has, especially I live next to San Jose State. And uh, I'm also concerned, you know, that they take the mopeds into, you know, the, uh, you know, San Jose State uh, area. But I think, you know, there should be some possibility to mitigate this uh, issue. So I would rather have, you know, both roads pursued, meaning uh, the scooter, uh, sorry, the mopeds and the cars. Uh, uh, to, to Charlie's point, and I agree with Wolfram that I think you kind of need to explore both at the same time, but can we make it so that um, Revel has a, a promotion push to educate people on the fact that this is a motorized vehicle. This is not in the same class as a scooter. Like, the, the difference with mopeds is it's like just a it's just a mile per hour difference between you requiring an M1 license. You know what I mean? This these things do not belong on sidewalks. They do not belong on right of ways. They're per, they're they're just a class lower than motorcycles. Is there a way we can compel them to have an education campaign prior to launch? Yes. Uh, Tamiko, maybe we can enhance that to say Rebel needs to come back where they plan on how they're going to continually keep San Jose State safe. You know, what, what is the plan to monitor or control or what is the solution for them to constantly do this? You know, like every time somebody gets on one, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I think that we need more information from Revel on how they're going to manage this safety risk. Well, it's gotta be not just San Jose State. It's gotta be any of the city's parks Right. Mm -hmm. and there has to be a hard geofence that you cannot, the, the, it can't be a safety issue for the bike, for the moped, right? Mm -hmm. That it stops, right? It has to yeah. be, you know, it stops. <coughs> and, and I don't care that the person on the moped is impacted when they're going into a park or the campus, because I think it's more important that the people on that, in the park and the campus are protected. And that's um, the crying, you know, uh, thing I got from all the Lyft people all the time and the Uber folks is, well, we can't slow down these uh, scooters because it's unsafe for the people on the scooters. Therefore, we have to have them cruise through the campus at five miles an hour. And we're willing to do that, but we're not willing to have a hard line where they can't come onto the campus. And to me, can I, uh, right line. this is Henry, can is I, uh, I would like to second uh, Charlie's uh, motion so we can have a discussion. So I have a second for Charlie's motion to recommend gig, but not rebel. 
So I'd be willing to amend my, uh, my motion here, okay, to say if there was a hard geofence around San Jose State and the city's parks, I'd be open to exploring a relationship with Revel. But if there can't be a hard fence around, that means no traffic, then I wouldn't be in. Can they geofence a block away, like make it so that the perimeter streets around San Jose State are inaccessible? I, I think you have to go down San Fernando and, and Fourth Street. I, I, I think that's the whole point of these things. Hmm. So I'm not trying. So I, I'm fine yeah. with people going down Fourth Street and San Fernando, right? 10th Street. That's all great. Yeah. They just can't get on the sidewalk of any of those streets and come onto the campus or, frankly, any park. And I would okay. I'll definitely support, you know, Charlie's uh, amended motion. All right. Why don't we take Why don't we take a a vote then? So Charlie's motion move forward with gig revel only if they allow or put together some kind of geofence around San Jose State parks, kind of other ped centric areas. All in support. Raise a hand. One, two, yes. three, four, five, six, and Wolfram seven. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Is that, is that the last Thank item you. on the agenda? Are we now done? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. David, they didn't tell you. There's only four meetings, but they're very long meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I provide comic relief from time to time. All right. Well, knowing that we have a full agenda still in front of me, um, and we just lost Sarah. She had mentioned that she was gonna to have to jump off for some other commitment. Um, so I'm gonna make a note of that real quick. 11 a.m. I'm gonna to try to jump through uh, this next item. So we are on item 5A, the 1920 annual financial report. I figured I would share the, the financials and kind of walk through the narrative piece if that works for everyone. And please stop me if you've got any uh, questions along the way. So our revenues for the year ended at 29 million. Um, a large portion of that 14.2 nearly was the SARA reimbursement. This is the final SARA reimbursement. And for David, the parking fund uh, loaned the redevelopment agency money over the years for debt service payments associated with the fourth and San Fernando garage. Um, and then we were repaid over the last couple of years with the dissolution of the redevelopment agency. And this is the final payment of that. So total revenue is 29 million of that. 11.5 was generated from our lots and garages, 3 million from the meters. As you can see, compared to our modified budget, uh, we were down 20 and 29% on our kind of operating revenues from our facilities and our meters. Due to the pandemic, we generated very little revenue, almost zero at the meters for April through uh, June, and then some contractual revenues associated with permits and stuff in the uh, lots and garages, but very minimal compared to a normal month. Um, our operating expenditures were 11.9 million, 85% um, of our modified budget total, um, savings, if you will, associated with our contractual elements. That would be our parking operator mostly, um, which was about 500,000 um, in unspent monies associated with furloughing employees from the, the operator side of things. Um, our security contract also had some savings as we reduced stationary guards at several facilities. Um, the police garage security detail, which predominantly worked the late night weekends around the kind of bar nightclub activities um, downtown was suspended because that activity no longer existed uh, for the kind of second or the last quarter of the year. So that's where we shook out from an expense perspective. Um, our transfers are what they are, whatever they're budgeted at is what we end up with in reality. They're typically one-time transfers. So we have a 
series of various transfers, everything from debt service on City Hall, our P bid payments for downtown, because we obviously own large pieces of property uh, with the parking facilities. We support the general fund, and so we provide them with a transfer and provide funding for the general fund of nearly $500,000 and some miscellaneous line items supporting downtown initiatives predominantly. Um, so where did we end up? Our net revenues were um, 15.5 million, lower by uh, about 2.4 million, uh, obviously due to those lower revenues. Um, Ending fund balance is $3.4 million. Um, obviously, again, off by our loss of revenues of a couple million dollars. Any questions on that piece? Nope. Okay. Can I other Quick question. Why do we give money to the general fund? Uh, we're voluntold to uh, provide that typically. Uh, we generate money in a, in a good year and the general fund needs support. And so it's basically the budget office identifying ancillary monies through various uh, funds in the city and <laughs> and, and, it, and, it, and it leaves. <laughs> Sorry for asking, but I did no, no. interesting that in these times they would be taking half a million dollars from a negative fund. That's all I'd say. And so this is last year. We're talking about last year's. So this money would have come out basically at the beginning of last fiscal year. Um, I can't recall exactly what our contribution is in our current fiscal year, which was obviously uh had the pandemic at the forefront. Um, but we'll, we'll touch on that at a future meeting when we review these numbers. I don't have that number right off the top of my head. Well, it was the same the year prior. So two years in a row. So that gives it's you- typically, It's typically right in there. Yep. Actually, the general fund's probably gonna be worse off and we'll have to see where we shake out. Um, our, our capital program, so we have a separate fund so this is the parking fund, and then we have a parking capital fund. Um, our 1920 budgeted totals, 13.5 million. Our final expenditures, 12.9. Our, our expenditures also include our encumbered money. So monies that were set aside for various projects or under contract, but not necessarily uh, checks written or cashed. Uh, this project line, the downtown event parking dynamic message signs, this project is complete finally after years. Uh, these are the signs that are around the downtown, predominantly around the Deridon area, right off the 87 Santa Clara off-ramp. There's one Julian 87 off-ramp. There are some others on Autumn, um, Julian, directing traffic predominantly for events. Um, that, that is off. So this line will go away in future reports. Uh, garage elevator upgrades, working with public works, spend about $60,000 uh, identifying some elevator projects or enhancements. Garage facade improvements. This is the work for the Market Street garage um, facade, which is in need of Replacement, which we've talked about before, we have an artist under contract developing a conceptual plan uh, for the new facade that'll be underway throughout this fiscal year and in all reality, future fiscal year, the next fiscal year after that through construction. Um, the greater downtown area multimodal, these are various kind of non-parking specific projects that the parking fund uh, provides funding for uh, LED streetlights, downtown wayfinding, signage, um, an event tracker system, which I believe is tied to kind of signals and the um, traffic management side of things so that they can work with event programming and set the, the traffic patterns. 
greater downtown parking inventory. This is really money earmarked for the Deridon area specifically um, on solving the parking and transportation needs in that area. So we've got monies under, uh, under uh, lock for site acquisition um, and parking development. Green technologies, we provided, we did some LED lighting upgrades at two facilities and finished those out. So those are complete uh, minor facility improvements. This is everything from, we did a lot paving project out at our Alum Rock and Manning, that's on East, or East Santa Clara all the way up in Alum Rock area, small parking lot that we repaved that was failing. Uh, we had a consultant who finished a facility assessment of all of our garages and we undertook all the necessary kind of immediate repairs for those. Uh, some paving at the South Hall lot, miscellaneous projects, everything from painting, door repair, glass, uh, anything that pops up throughout the portfolio, spend some money there. Our revenue control project, this is the project to replace all the garage revenue control systems. So that money is under contract with our parks vendor ski data. Um, that's nearing completion. We're gonna be entering into the final testing of those systems. So we can sign off on that and close that project out here in the next couple of months. And our command center build out at the fourth in San Fernando where we can remotely manage all eight of our garages from one centralized location, uh, which will be very well utilized given our current situation in the pandemic and the reduced resources that we have. So that's the, the shakeout for 1920 capital. So Aaron, yep. so all this stuff is interesting and good, but do we have the forecast for this coming year? We have, yes, we have done that initial budget for our 2021, um, which we projected, we were about 9 million in revenue is what our projection was instead for, for these two line items. Well, it's going to be next to zero though, right? What was that? The forecast was going to be next to zero. Well, we're still, we're generating revenue. Um, it's not zero. We still have quite a few monthly parkers um, in our portfolio, although the occupancy wouldn't uh, show them. There are lots of companies that are continuing to pay for their monthly permits, um, presumably because they know they will be back and they don't want to not have parking in the future. There are a lot of uh, contracts that we have that provide long-term parking for years. And so they're compelled to continue those agreements. But, um, but do you have a schedule like this that has the budget that we crafted back in, you know, uh, the spring yeah. uh, and, and what our latest forecast is knowing that we're not coming out of this for through the end of this fiscal year? Yes. And so we are at a staff level continually kind of doing that on a month by month basis. The city's process would be a mid-year update, which will come out, you know, right after the new year, after the holidays. And we're continually tracking where we stand now. Um, optimistically, you know, our, we're thinking we might be slightly under that kind of projection of 9 million, uh, maybe closer to seven or 8 million, but we're, we're kind of taking it month by month to a certain degree. But yes, we are tracking that. And I think at the next meeting, we'll, we will have good details to share. I read this is if you have 9 million of revenue, which I think is on the high side, but, but you know, you, you'll get there. Um, and you have 12 million of expenses or $3 million in the hole. And then you have all the other things that David was pointing out that all the transfers out, right? That add up to enough. So do we have enough money in the reserve to cover the deficit that we're going to be running this year? Yeah. And so I'll hit on a little bit of that in the uh, 2021 capital where we reduced several projects throughout this year. And obviously 
vacancies that existed that generated some of the savings here um, from a city staffing level are being filled um, and are constantly looking for ways in our contractual elements as well to reduce expenses. Um, I think, yeah, it'll be a negative and do we have enough in the reserves? We have quite a bit in our reserve um, currently, but it's not our goal to rely on that in a significant way. Hey, Aaron, uh, how does any of the Google development or the new developments around downtown impact the parking budget in any way or are those separated out? Well, obviously we're setting monies aside in our capital for Deridon, you know, parking and transportation. We have a reserve line item in the capital side of things. Um, is that, yeah, so here's our current reserves with Deridon, you know, $8 million. So there's monies held there in terms of greater downtown developments and direct impacts to parking, not in the short run, you know, after completion, will it generate some, some revenues? Yeah, I would think so, especially to the extent their parking demand exceeds their provided on-site parking. Yeah, I just, I'm just wondering, I guess, more long-term, because I know the development on park is basically they're shutting down park. Yep. Um, so all the parking that's along the street there is gone, gonna be gone once they're done. And I don't know what yeah, other- Yeah, and so, I mean, those are, you know, losing 10 to 20 meters. I think there are some impacts to the parking fund, obviously, but it's, it's not that significant, you know, it's 20 out of 2000 is- but There's a lot of other development happening. That's just, just part that is right yep. in front of us, but there's- Yep, so some... it, it will have some, some impact to the meter revenue specifically. Arian, as, as someone who just is about to finish a new parking garage, yep. um, a 1,500 stall parking garage that cost me about $50 million, not including land, this $8 million isn't going to go a long way two or three years from now constructing a garage. Correct. I don't disagree with that statement. And we've told the powers to be that this is not enough money, nor are we capable pre-pandemic or certainly not now to backstop the construction of a, you know, hundred million dollar parking structure. It, it would just be helpful to me, Arian, you know, you know as, a, as a CFO, and I'm sure Harvard's in that same space, you know, we're going to talk about capital in a five-year capital plan. We're going to do all that. It's hard to talk about that when you're not grounded in what this year and, and with all the crap that's going on is truly looking like. And without seeing that forecast, I don't, I don't know how I make calls on you know, what to approve or not approve or what to green light or whatever on our capital list going forward. I'm trying to pull up, let's see. So, Arian, so, while you're pulling that up, um, at our, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go so, Arian, you, you mentioned that, yeah, the city very much we know that the funds and the reserves are not adequate to construct a facility, but, you know, there's support for interim parking lots in the arena area, as well as opportunities if we're talking about the downtown near the convention center, I mean, it may go towards what we call parking plus, where a private entity is building a facility and the city contributes X amount of funding for additional parking to be constructed with that development. It's what was done with the Globe Garage and um, I think the one we have at 3rd and Santa Clara. And so, you know, I, I was pulling up, thank you, Laura, I was pulling up our, what we had shared at the last meeting, our 2021 proposed budget, which was 13 million between lots and garages and our parking meters compared to 
and a prior year in the last year or two, which was closer to 18 to 19 million. So we were already projecting those numbers. I think we backed off of that at least internally, but we don't have an opportunity yet within the city's official process to update our budgets. Although we are at a staff level continually tracking and updating our internal documents, but the city as a whole is not presenting anything different than the 2021 proposed numbers at this point. We will certainly be raising the, you know, the item internally with our budget office and everything as we develop the mid-year revised numbers and, and even earlier now, prior to that time frame after the holidays. So I think we will certainly share that information with the board at the next uh, next meeting. Our, 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 our. Got some feedback there, Henry. Yeah. Um, I can quickly. This is the, the summary table that we show each time on the revenues and expenses at each facility, acknowledging the fact that most of the expenses, um, particularly from the city side and our contractor side are, are not direct <coughs> facility expenses. They're allocated expenses based on uh, size, scale and scope of the activities at a, at a facility. It's kind of a, a metric that we use um, so to say that the convention center generated $283,000, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, a lot of the, you know, audit and overhead and everything else is just a function of how large the garage is and how much of the city's time um, we believe we put towards those facilities. Um, but the revenue totals up here are a breakout of the total revenues that the fund saw. So uh, Market Street was 4 million, Convention Center 2.4, uh, and so on. And there's the, the meters. Uh, the customer service survey, so we only got to do one this year. We typically do two. The second one would have been done during the period of time of the kind of closures or suspended parking operations. Um, for the most part, our average scores here are in line with our, you know, last year, um, up a little bit in our parking equipment, which is a positive sign given the upgrades we've done. Um, the Globe facility was not upgraded. We're working on an upgrade with a different technology solution there, something significantly cheaper. It doesn't generate the revenue, so substantiate a couple hundred thousand dollars in the, the technology that we put in the other facilities, but this should tick up once we fix that. Um, in appearance and cleanliness, we've had some issues as well as the safety side of things. I've had some conversations with the residents over there recently, along with uh, the, um, the chief or the captain of PD. And so we've been working on kind of attacking some of these things along with uh, Sarah Mancuso represents the property management of the towers at second property adjacent to the third street garage. So I've had a couple of meetings with her team over there on how to address some of the safety concerns that they see there with transients in the garage and some of the break-ins. So we're, we're working diligently on trying to drive that number um, up. So that would conclude the 1920 annual financial report. This is a, uh, a recommended approval item for us to kind of put a stamp on it and file it. If I could get a motion or a second. <laughs> Don't all jump forward. <laughs> Got motion to approve. You Wolfram. A second, anyone? All right, thank you, Charlie. All in favor? 
Aye. Side of hands. Aye. One, two, three, four. Aye. Five, six. Okay. Sarah is absent. All right. Item 5B. Uh, Elias, Heather, you guys going to run with that one? Yes. Uh, thank you, Arian. Uh, this is just uh, an update on the meter revenue uh, as related to the uh, upgrades that we did in uh, 17, 18, and when, where we, when we expanded the smart meters to the exterior meter areas. At the time, we anticipated that the cost recovery would be, will be uh, done by fiscal year 19, 20, but unfortunately, due to almost uh, zero revenue in the last quarter of 1920, we weren't able to hit the target. We are still about 140K short. Um, as far as the revenue, um, it is still a consistent uh, as uh, far as the revenue share in the meter areas with downtown having 66% of the total revenue SOFA and perimeter is 17%, Old Civic is 8%, and Japan Town at 9%. Uh, the revenue outlook for fiscal year 2020 is very difficult to predict, especially when we have we still have 35% of our meters still not charging and the COVID environment. Uh, it's important also to note here that although the meters are free, but we still have ongoing costs in incurred on them. Um, a quick update also on the status of the upgrades that we, that we have been working on. Uh, we finished uh, upgrading all our meters that use 2G communication to 4G and also upgraded the meters to accept American Express and Discover, as well as Visa MasterCard. Um, we are waiting for the remaining meters to be activated uh, in order to complete the pay by phone feature on them in the areas where the pay, you know, the exterior areas where we didn't have that service before. That's it. Elias, do you want to open the, do you want to share your screen and show the table real quick and walk through it? Or? Oh. oh, while you're doing that, I have a very quick question. Could someone email me a map of what these three areas are, the, 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 uh, demand, the, the boundaries between Japantown, Old Civic, and SOFA and Perimeter, just so I understand what's what? Thank you. That'd be good to send it to the entire board. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. I basically run through it. Um, the uh, table here sh shows our shortfall for uh, cost recovery, which is almost 140K um, as a separate itemized revenue for uh, downtown core, we just added that for informational. The chart about the uh, single space meter revenue a share in the different meter areas, we can see that here downtown core is at 66% of the revenue. So fine perimeter is 17%, Old Civic is 8%, and Japan Town is at 9%. Um, I'm willing to take any questions. Can you scroll up a little bit just so we can see the headings on that table? Oh, 
look at Japantown coming in with a positive net revenue. Yeah. Generally do. <laughs> <laughs> So we, do we have any forecast for 2021 here? Same question as I was asking before. Well, uh, because we don't know what's going to happen with the uh, exterior areas, if they're going to continue to be free or not, it is going to be difficult to do a solid forecast. But our estimate, if we continue at this way, at this uh, is that they won't exceed about uh, 700K. So the 2.5 million is gonna be 700K? Correct. If things don't change. Yeah, if that's, that's uh, estimate based on if we continue at current levels with the current meters at their current rates in uh, you know, exterior continues to be free, that would be the estimate for the year. And, and why would anybody think it's going to be different? Um, oh, I don't get, know. <laughs> as, yeah, I and mean, as we get to the next, a uh, little further down the agenda, we have a uh, discussion on kind of the exterior meters and potential changes to rate structures um, to kind of discuss conceptually. So, yeah, we can uh, raise rates, but then that just drives people away. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you end up with the yeah. same negative revenue. No, I'm sorry. Exactly. We're not looking to, to raise rates. That's not what we're going to kind of discuss, kind of change our rate structure and how and when we charge. Um, and extend so hours, though. So Extend hours. So, but that's the next agenda item, right? Right. That's, what I'm, so that's, that's coming up. So I'm, I'm, we'll, we can further that discussion a little bit later on in the agenda. Yeah. yeah. My problem here, David, is that I'm getting yesterday's information and being asked to make tomorrow's decisions. And we, we have half of a loaf here, that, or not even half a loaf, we have 5% you know, of uh, what this coming year is looking like. And I don't know how to make decisions when I don't have the data that, that is available with assumptions. Right. At this point in the agenda, we're kind of just, we haven't gotten to the making decisions for future yet, Charlie. We're kind of getting through our kind of 1920, this is what happened. This is giving you the context of the end year, um, and we'll move into... Understood. Let me future. know when I should ask the forecast questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is another recommendation item to accept this report by the board. Motion. Can we? Henry says move acceptance. Henry, you second it? All right. Yeah. All in favor? Hey, Elias, can you stop sharing? There we go. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right. Thank you. 2021 capital. So this is our current capital year. We're effectively a a quarter into the year. Uh, I can spend a very brief amount because I don't know how much of this is going to stick at this point, but let's share screen. I can walk you quickly through our 2021 budget, which was prepared prior to the pandemic, had a budget of $10 million in capital with about 7.5 million in carryover monies that were either encumbered, basically encumbered monies, monies that were tagged from the prior year, as well as monies that we identified that wouldn't be spent in 1920 that we still wanted to have access to in 2021. So those three columns total our modified 2021 budget. So about 19 million. Obviously, as the pandemic came, we started to identify where could we reduce some things, reduce projects, and or save money. And so the red 
or identifying project savings or reductions, <coughs> we transferred funds from the capital fund over to our operating fund. So back into the parking fund for 2021. So we reduced projects by 2 million and we scrubbed the interest on these reserve lines of a million for $3 million. So this is where the shortfall that we had identified very early in the pandemic was being offset by in some ways, in addition to savings through operations. But this was an initial reaction to pull $3 million back over into the operating. That currently leaves us with about 16.917 million in capital across these project lines. Um, this project is all but spent and done, the dynamic message sign, that's gonna go away. Leaves us with 1.75 in elevator upgrades. This one, we may or may not proceed with this. We're waiting on an evaluation by Public Works of some of our facilities and their, and their elevators. Are any of these immediate need to happen or are these more nice to happen type of upgrades and or uh, repairs. So we'll continue to monitor that one. The facade improvement, this one is moving forward. Uh, the engineers have said that the facade on the Market Street garage has to be replaced. So we are continuing forward with that project. The, the design for the concept is going forward throughout this calendar year. And then we'll work with Public Works on construction documents and bidding and everything else. It's a long project. Um, not much identified here. Obviously, that's why we reduced it down to very minimal. Uh, we've got a little bit of LED streetlight projects to take up that amount. Uh, greater downtown parking inventory. This is some held over monies for Deridon. Um, obviously, if we need anything, anything comes out of that, that's where the reserve would come in and fund that line item. Um, green technologies, nothing. We zeroed that line out effectively. The minor facility improvements, this one, we have 2 million. We are reviewing the consultant's report on facility repairs that were necessary. Um, don't know that we're going to do much more than what we've got identified here. Obviously, every year we need some funds for just all the miscellaneous items that come up in a portfolio, um, which historically is about a million dollars, but we'll be tracking that very closely. Um, revenue control upgrades. Most of this money is obviously tied up in our command, our command center build out and our parks upgrade. So this should be spent throughout the year basically the checks cut against what we encumbered through the year. Um, security improvements, we're gonna be using some of this money to enhance the um, camera system in our garages. Currently we have cameras at our exit lanes only. Some of our entry lanes are covered. We'd like to enhance that with cameras in all of our entry lanes, as well as over our point of sale areas, that would be our pay stations. Um, so we can have eyes, this will help us run all of our facilities in that command center. Um, the reserves stay where they are. Um, and so that's the, the current 2021 capital. Unless there's any questions, I can jump right to the, the next one. The 22 through 26 capital, this one should be quick. Well, Arian, on the bottom sure. of that page, though. I'm sorry? On the bottom of the page you were just showing. Yeah, I can show that again. Hold on. Yep. So it said that we had this. We're looking to take $24 million of uh, the reserves that we were hoping to have and put it towards these places. Yeah. Currently, the only yeah, amount that we took from, from the capital side to put into the operating was the billion, which was just generated on the, the, the 19, the, the, you know, the 24 million. Yeah. So this is 8.6 8. and 16.3. Still sits in the reserves. 
and there's two reserved for line items, items a dear darn on one specifically, specifically, and then a more generic parking reserve. I could have sworn. Aaron, you, you went robo again. <laughs> yeah, my question is I thought on an earlier slide we had $8 million uh, set aside for the SAP Deer Don parking garage. And that's where I made my comments that that's woefully short. But on this page, it says $16 million for the SAP Deer Don garage. My voice wasn't on the cross that. You guys hear me? and it looks like you have some audio problems. You come across very distorted, uh, at least at my end. Same here. If you turn off your screen, Arian, oh, you just did. That may help. So, so Harvard, um, there are two capital reserves. There's 8.6 in the um, parking and transportation capital reserve, and then there's 16.3 in the Deridon SAP area reserve. So it's a total of about close to 25 million in reserve, capital reserve. My question is from the accounting that we saw from 1920 earlier on, I could be wrong, I'm, I apologize if I'm uh, making us go backwards guys, but I could have sworn it said 8.6 for the Deer Don Garage on that slide. Yeah, I don't, I'm trying to find that, what you were looking at. Erin, can you put up the slide from uh, your first financial update? Is my audio any better? It is. All right. So let's see. Which, I'm sorry, which one did you want me to pull up? First financial slide at the bottom of it. The First year, financial slide. 1920 actuals. The 1920 actuals. Yep, stand by. Right. I think the increase in the, the reserves is from the Sarah reimbursement. The 14 million that we got in, I think was dispersed among the, the reserves. So does this say we have $8 million or that we added the, that to me at the end of 1920 by 8 million? No, this is saying that there's 4.5 and 8.1 in the reserve. So that's 12 million total. At the end of 1920, right. the, the new, sorry, shifting screens here. The new modified 2021 now increases those. And I believe it is a function of the Sarah reimbursement that we got in, in 1920 was used to fund those two reserves. So. Didn't we have this discussion a year or two ago um, that we need to see the bridge of how from 12 million, the eight and the four from last year, how does that change to eight and 16 in this coming year? Is this nothing that you showed us that shows an increase into those reserves? Let's see. Isn't it this just the Sarah reimbursement? It's not, yeah, so that's not a direct link. And I, I agree, we could probably do a cleaner job of doing that. And it's not specific. So let me see, oops, wrong. So we transfer out of the operating fund monies for the capital fund. 
each year. So I think we can do a better job of calling out than where is that money going? And so if the 21 million went out, then it funded the capital and we can, we can tie that better. I will make a note of that so that in future reports, we have a better, cleaner tie. Yeah, I think I asked that question a year or two ago. And you know, it, it, to me, it's just all of a sudden, boom, the, in, the amount increases and I have no idea how it increased. I will make a note. And I, I guess kind of where I'm still on this path here, and I'm, I try to be consistent in my questions, is, is that without knowing what our forecast is for this year, is that the best use or the proper use of that money to put it, squirrel it away for other things? Or do we need to hold some of that back? And I'll use the rainy day analogy of, you know, do we need something to cover our operations because once we put it into the SAP or whatever these reserve accounts are, I don't know if we can claw that money back. Yeah, we absolutely can. And we've already identified it. it it's, not, it's not beholden to be set there. It is a safer place for the parking fund to put the money away, I think, so that it is identified outside of a you know, net balance or something that the, the general fund could... <laughs> See, although the budget office knows it's there, it's not that they don't know, but it is identified for future projects, which generally they, they, um, they accept. Um, but to the extent we need money to balance our operating budget, the, the capital reserves is certainly a place where we may have to dip. Thank you. And, and Green, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but wasn't the actions to place the funding here made by council in a prior five-year CIP action item with the adopted budget. I'm sorry, I broke up again. Sorry, so, so this, the amounts that are shown here in the 2021 CIP are based on actions council took in a prior year. Absolutely, yeah. Relative to the five-year parking fund CIP. Yes, yeah. So it's already been decided that that's where the funding would go. And it, if it were needed to be changed, then that would be a subsequent council action. Correct. And, you know, we develop our capital in January, January and, you know, it was all but buttoned up at that point. And then the pandemic hit. And then it was a matter of how much, if any changes could happen in those waning first weeks of the pandemic. And I don't know that anything changed that early on as nobody fully understood the ramifications of it in, you know, March when they were really stamping it for the next year. So. I remember having those conversations. It's like, what if anything should we do? Are we going to be spending these capital monies? Are we going to have them? You know, but I think it was just so early at the time. So yeah, everything that's published now is going to be up for modification at the mid-year time frame. I agree. Can we move on to the uh, yep. five-year plan? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, this will be real quick. I think I was showing that previously. So, so I, I know there's a bunch of other items on the agenda. Um, I think this will take two seconds, Laura. What? Let's just, let me just do this for two okay. seconds. So really the short and sweet of our five-year planning is that at this point in time, we typically really get underway in earnest in our five-year planning in January, since we aren't meeting with you guys until after that, we brought, we, we have for the last couple of years brought forward a real, real, real early look at our five-year. And what we're showing you now, just like we did last year, is that our current four years on the books are these four years here, 21, 22 through 24, 25. We are not proposing any changes to those currently this early in the game plan. 
it's showing $3 million plus or minus um, in capital for all four of those years. Most of that tied up in our minor facility improvements, 1.75. So more than half of it is there. And then a small amount of, for elevator upgrades, 500,000 about gets us one elevator overhaul or maintenance a year. Um, and these things do need it. Um, so really 2.25 of 3 million is tied up in those two line items. We are not showing anything in our fifth year yet, simply because we haven't put anything together. And historically, if we don't have any clearly identified project for that far out, we'll just take our fourth year, copy paste and put it in our fifth year and, and move that forward. Um, so Arian, would you, uh, would you give us an understanding of why there's the reserves, zero reserves on this form? It's, we are not showing any funding of the reserves on here. So we aren't adding funding. It's not that there won't be any, it's just that we don't have any additional funds earmarked for it. So, so it would stay at money, the uh, prior, it would stay at the prior eight plus 16 million for SAP? Yeah, whatever the ending reserve balance is in uh, 2021 would carry over. Got you. So. Thanks. That's this early, early look. Obviously, it's super early for us to even have a real concept of big changes in the out years at this point, given what we don't know about our revenues. I suspect this is what we would stick with, maybe even a small downward trend in some of these other miscellaneous items. Are there any other comments? We're running out of time. Yep. 6A. I will make them this pay for Heather and Elias. Uh, 6B. We already did 6A. No, oh. I'm sorry. Nope, sorry. I was oh. jumping to 7A. I'm out of. I'm all out of whack on my agenda. I'm going to try to go fairly quickly through this. Um, go real high level for you. I hope you've had a chance to kind of review the memo. Um, just keeping in mind when we're talking through this. At this point, it's conceptual. We're not asking for the board to take a hard action on any of the specifics. It's just to kind of discuss through this potential approach. Um, so uh, as you recall, probably um, from se our several meetings and our conversations, there are meters in the, in the exterior that are still free. At the onset of COVID pandemic, we um, transitioned to um, free parking in all of our facilities and on street. Um, as we progressed through in June, we went to council and asked for uh, forgiveness for making that move without council approval. Um, and then, and um, also kind of laid out a plan for uh, options to re-engage parking. At that time, council took action on our parking rate resolution um, for on-street park, or for, excuse me, for uh, parking garages. And one of the key elements in that uh, package was the 90 minutes of free parking um, at our facilities. You recall that when we originally brought that to you, we were looking at a 60 minute free period um, due to COVID and kind of impacts, we extended that to that 90 minutes. So keep that in mind that in the downtown, that is an ongoing kind of relief and option for individuals in the downtown. The exterior meters on the outside, uh, East Santa Clara, Japan town, um, kind of outside in SoFa a little bit, and then East, uh, I'm sorry, Old Civic Center, those do not have uh, garage adj garages adjacent to them. So they do not have that kind of 90 minutes free option. Um, so keep that in mind as we kind of walk through this. So um, uh, we will need to go back to council at some point here. We're uh, targeting uh, January. Right past the holidays and it looks like we would be on an agenda potentially for January. Um, at that time, we could either go with an informational memo that indicates we are going to just turn back on the meters at the current rate and um, using our current structure, the uh, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. universal throughout all of our uh, on-street meters. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, the downtown core was re-engaged for paid parking on street on August 3rd. So they've had um, paid parking in the downtown core for quite some time. 
The other option is to move towards this conceptual idea of changing how we structure our rates and how we structure um, time, paid time at the meters. Um, and that, uh, that would move us to a banded parking structure. So we would um, band our parking based on time so in 30 hour increments and then based on occupancy uh, that is experienced during those bands, we would drive the pricing. So this would be um, universal across all of the meters. So not just in the exterior, I wanna make that clear that it's, it's a proposal for the entire um, on-street parking system. Uh, we would have uh, the ability then, as I mentioned, to kind of long-term make more adjustments to rates based on the activity that's driving um, in those areas. Uh, the rate would be adjusted based like on occupancy, but at the discretion of the director. Um, and we would move to make changes probably twice a year, not a, not a real regular basis, but review data and make changes up or down based on that occupancy experience during the previous six months twice a year, uh, giving us more flexibility. Um, as part of this package, we would propose conceptually that Japantown, Old Civic, East Santa Clara, the kind of exterior would set the rates um, initially, hypothetically at a dollar. So a 50% reduction in what the current rate is on the books. Um, that way uh, they, they get a kind of a continued relief um, and even though they don't have the 90 minutes free, that kind of gives them a 50% reduction. Um, there are expenses, as, as uh, Elias alluded to earlier in his revenue memo, that are occurring uh, regardless of the, if the meters are on or off. So it's about a $200,000 a year expense for us to run the smart meters um, just because they're in the ground. So um, it's, it's an important financial decision for us to make on when we re-engage these exterior meters and, at, and how we do it. Um, so along with moving to a potential banded parking structure um, and setting uh, a reduced rate in the exterior, keeping the downtown core at its current $2, um, we also are, are um, proposing conceptually that we increase the meter hours. So we would uh, go an hour earlier and start at 8 a.m. and move all the way till 8 p.m. So a two hour buffer or increase on the back end of our current nine to six hours. Um, we know that there's activity, parking activity that is going on during these hours. Um, currently it's a free, it, it's free. Um, and we know, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that that's a potential to balance kind of the rate structure and the revenue. Um, if we continue, as Elias alluded to earlier, if we continue right now in our current cadence, only downtown parking meters on at the $2 rate during, its, during the current hours, and we keep uh, exterior meters free, um, we would anticipate only $700,000 in the revenue for the year, um, which is gets us a half a million dollars above potentially our uh, operating expense for the meters, but still not a significant amount. And you saw um, what was what the parking fund is kind of looking like long term. Um, so we need to really kind of look at ways to balance, um, you know, businesses and business needs as well as the parking, the health of the parking fund. Um, so analysis is very difficult to do because we don't know what parking rev what parking occupancy is going to do as we kind of move through this potential COVID recovery. Um, so in the memo, you will see we, we did an analysis based on pre-COVID revenues um, because it was our, our best kind of picture to see if we go ahead with these changes, if we move to banded parking, if we reduce the, the rate to a dollar an hour um, initially in the exteriors, if we expand um, the meter hours, um, if we take all of these pieces, what would that have done to us pre-COVID? So we can kind of have an apples to apples comparison um, pre-COVID and, and really it, it comes out as uh, a slight reduction in, in overall revenues, but fairly, fairly close. Um, and, and really this, this proposed concept is setting us up for kind of our future um, 
parking structure and how we are going to operate long term. Um, as uh, you guys gave uh, heard a presentation from Jessica Zank and Emily last last meeting about the need to um, kind of align start aligning parking and our processes and our our operations with the overall arching goals of the city and our mode shift and our climate smart goals. Um, parking is a key key to that. Um, and as Laura Stuchinski kind of came to you today with the um, desire to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through shared vehicles. Um, this would allow us the flexibility uh, um, to adjust those rates to help assist in accomplishing those goals. Um, it is going to be part of the downtown um, transportation plan at some level. There will be some, um, some guidance in that document that is going to ask parking to make some adjustments similar to what we're proposing here. Um, this is not a new concept. Uh, cities across the Bay Area and across the nation currently use this kind of um, pricing model uh, that allows them kind of dynamic um, or nimble pricing. So it's not a new concept um, in the industry um, and it's used to drive and really kind of set kind of for fair market pricing in areas. It gives us the triggers based on data and information as opposed to a kind of blanket one size, trying to use a blanket one size fits all for every area in the city. Because we know that all the meter areas react differently and have different needs um, and parking and, and what we charge and when we charge are all part of that. Um, so again, as I mentioned that we we really kind of have two options on the table for you to kind of consider um, as we move forward towards reinstatement of uh, on-street parking across the entire system. And it's, um, we do not need council approval to turn back on the meters at our current uh, $2 rate, current hours. Um, we will go with an info memo. We, are, we do need to go and tell the council what we've, we've done, but they don't need, we don't need approval there. Um, if we move to something that's different, there will be a requirement that we change our rate resolution and lay out kind of all the specifics and the parameters of what we want to do. Um, and that will require actual council action. Um, again, we would anticipate going in January. It's time frame. So, so Heather, uh, uh -huh. a question on page two, the last paragraph talks about a rate range citywide of one to five dollars. What mm -hmm. does that mean? So we would set the director to have authority to change the hourly parking rate by district in each individual areas twice a year. Um, we would set it at you know uh, uh, a level that he could change it in increments of say hypothetically 50 cents. And so every year we go and assess or twice a year we'd assess and see what the parking occupancy did and it, did it change or did it stay the same or did it reduce? If it didn't, if it didn't change, then we would keep le levels at the as is, if it increased, we would increase parking rates potentially. If the occupancy decreased, we have the opportunity to reduce the, the hourly rate. The one to five would just give us the parameters of what we could potentially operate in. So we could move, we could move in 50 cent increments and max out, we couldn't raise it above $5 an hour or go below a dollar an hour. So you know, I guess my, my, my that's the range. Is, yeah, my concern is, giving authority to go potentially to five dollars uh i don't think the community is going to accept that um and i don't know if we've had the public outreach on this item because it to give the director the authority to go up to five dollars hypothetically um uh, it's not good for downtown nor the exterior areas so that is to give us flexibility. It wouldn't, we would never be able to jump to $5. It would be a slow, if, it, if the occupancy drove the rates that way, it would not be a decision necessarily that the director or our staff would make because we feel like it needs to be increased. It would be based, it's data driven, purely, pure and simple. We set the parameters. And if the data and the occupancy show that there's an increased activity and there should be then an increase in a rate, it would be at a slow pace, no more than 50 cents 
each time we do an assessment. And just because we go up doesn't mean we can't go back down. And the $5, it just hypoth that's again, a conceptual range in the memo, um, wouldn't, would be that at some point we couldn't go above the $5. Um, with regard to your question on outreach, we've not done the public outreach or engaged in that at this point because we wanted to come to the board to see if conceptually it was something you wanted us to pursue and thought that it would be a good direction for us to move, move in. Um, so so it if it is a conceptual model that um, the board would like us to see uh, continue to march down that path and move toward, then yes, we would do some outreach with um, different agencies and entities regarding the specifics on where we would set um, time bands, where we would set uh, rates, where we would start, et cetera. All of those pieces would be solidified um, and part of it, part of that process would be some, some outreach. Okay, let's, let's, let's get some more input from other members. So this is Wolfram. So my input on this is, first of all, I'm not agreeing with this conceptual approach for several reasons. Number one, what Henry already stated, you know, I think $5 per hour, even if it's just hypothetical, is not flying. We're driving business away from downtown. The other thing I don't agree with is uh, you go with a bandit structure. Bandit structures are very complicated. And, you know, people have to understand what is the cheapest rate I can do my shopping? Is it, you know, it in band one? Is it in band three? And we have actually the, the most expensive band at number two, which is at lunchtime. So that actually means if I go with uh, $5 an hour, you charge people for just $10 parking for going to lunch. And the same will be for dinner because, you know, you a, a increases it from six to eight. So we also drive away, you know, uh, people who visit downtown for, you know, getting some dinner. So I'm not in, in favor of uh, this kind of proposal. I think we should go back what we had before and, uh, you know, just keep the existing rates. That's just my input. I'd like to add that, you know, keeping the meters off in Japantown has made a hundred percent difference in our businesses surviving, literally surviving. And I've been taking frequent trips to downtown to see what a mess it is in terms of boarded up storefronts, a lack of motivation uh, to be there. And it, it, it's painful. It's absolutely painful. I think messing around with the, the parking structure right now is, is a, a terrible idea um, economically because right now downtown is suffering so much as it is. Like there's nothing stopping anyone from shopping at Prune Yard, at Santana Row, at Valley Fair, any Willow Glen, any place that there is free parking. And I think making changes right now is just the wrong decision. So just just to add the, you know, to look to Heather's comments is it don't get lost the fact that all decisions about rates would be driven by activity and occupancy. And we'd be setting the rates initially at a lower rate outside of the downtown core. And then if, and only if, I mean, all reality would point to, you know, in the short run, the rates coming down in all likelihood, um, possibly to whatever floor level it is set, but the, the, my, my counter to, you know, well, it's expensive if somebody's just coming down to dinner. Well, only if the data supports the rate. Wait a second though. Like we brought a, a survey with almost a thousand respondents having to do with what Japantown wanted in terms of rates. And you guys were able to justify a, a, a rate jump from a dollar to $2 an hour just to support the installation of the smart meters. So Eve, it, what data are you going by? Are you going by the data that supports the health of the, the, the fund? Or is it the health of the economy around it? You can't look at things in a vacuum. It would be occupancy data. So if we set for, just hypothetically, we reduce the rate and we set, we turn back on the meters and we set it in Japantown. Let's just use that as an example. We set it at the dollar rate, the reduced rate from the $2. That would stay in effect if occupancy, and I did not rebound, if occupancy is driven in your, in your scenario by 
businesses and, and how they're doing and how many customers are coming down. If that stays as is and the, rec the economy doesn't recover, the businesses aren't recovering, they're not getting the customers to come in, that occupancy level is not going to, that's not going to rise. And the rise in occupancy is what needs to happen to trigger a, a, a increase to the next 50 cent increment. We totally vice understand versa, that. Vice versa, down, downward as well. If, if we set the rate and it's driving potential, has the potential to you know, reduce occupancy, then we would reduce the rate. It's allowing us to kind of find the equilibrium on what is happening, to your point, we, we set the $2 rate um, mm -hmm. to engage the smart meters. Well, that not, isn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily based on occupancy and the activity of the businesses and their customers. It was based on um, more of the need to recover capital, and the outgoing, all of those right. additional. Right. So costs. you justified you justified it. So you're through changing. That means. You're changing to a model that better serves your businesses and your customers, and what's actually transpiring and happening. Right. So it is okay, a. Heather, we've we've made it clear over multiple years what we desire and what benefits the businesses down here, and the DPB operates somewhat independently of our surveyed results out of the information that I bring to you. Our meters are net positive and they continue to be net positive. But yet when it comes to the fact that we have not received any money back for our meters, financially at all, in Japantown, no, no representation, nothing for taxation at all. You guys tend to minimize our contributions. So what's the point in just leaving it, leaving the meters off for a little while, leave them off for a year, let us get through this difficult period economically, see what shakes out, and then work on a banded system. Because right now, the, the system that you're conceptually talking about affects not only the businesses, but the multiple residents who live here. We have no garages, and literally every business on, on our metered zone has second floor residences that are bachelor units built in the 1930s. So you're not just affecting the businesses, you're affecting our residency, you're affecting the rent population, you're affecting everything down here. And we also have two major developments happening within a block of here, which means we're losing even more parking to construction for at least a year. Well, let me try something here, guys. So, so Heather, I fully appreciate trying to get to a market demand um, rate for parking. I, I, I'm there, you know, to me, that's the right way to do business. What's completely tone deaf in this proposal right now is we're going through the worst times that the city has ever probably ever seen. And the, the headline in whatever newspaper you choose to read will be parking board, city council, fill in the blank, Heather uh, has said, we want to raise parking to $5 an hour. That's going to be the headline. And I know that's not where this is going. It's going to be driven by demand, but by, saying now we give you the ability to do that, people are gonna say they're gonna do that. I know you're not, and I trust you, and I believe this committee is not gonna do that, but today is the wrong time to put this up for a vote. You gotta wait a year. You, we gotta get out of this shit before we put this type of vote forward. And I'll be the first one to say, raise the rates when there's you know demand for parking. Yep. But now is the Absolutely. wrong time to be sending that signal to people in the downtown. Here's yeah, another I, thing I, if I may, there's another thing that I pointed out to D3 and I've said since day one, since this all came down, since we have not received any meter funds for Japantown, I'm holding my constituents back from taking this to the media under the auspices that this is a racist policy because we are <laughs> the only district of color, the only cultural district with meters in the city. And I'm having to tell my constituents, please don't take this to KTVU. Please don't take this to Len Ramirez. I'm not trying to make this a race-based issue. But a lot of my people feel that this is just another thing that we're getting pinned on our, on our neighborhood. And we're the only cultural district with these meters. So what does that tell you? I can't, and it's a headline thing. I'm, I'm warning you guys, this looks so bad from the city perspective, I'm not trying to make more waves because it just means more work for everyone involved, but it looks bad. Yeah, you know, I think that um, 
tagging on to Charlie, and I'll probably ask the downtown association to kick in on this, but you know, the biggest concern with this downtown right now is how to get people to feel comfortable coming back because there's a big safety issue right now. Uh, I think that's being addressed. And that's what I, I believe most people are concerned about, about coming back to downtown mm -hmm. is this, how, how's this, you know, how's the safety issue going to be resolved because the dynamics of the downtown have changed now that everybody has left downtown because of the pandemic yeah. and you've got people that people don't feel comfortable being around and events happening in downtown because they're just not enough normal activity. Um, and so I, I kind of agree that just from a optic standpoint, this memo probably doesn't real bode real well at this time. I would endorse, I would support it when the downtown has become more, you know, come back to more of a normal situation. But right now it's, how do we get people back into it? And, and um, I don't know if downtown association, you guys want to kick in on what your thoughts are and if safety is an issue right now for growing um, downtown back. Yeah, this is Nathan here. Uh, thanks, Herbin. We have a couple uh, board members and businesses obviously here as well. Um, but just in terms of thinking strictly policy, uh, but then also obviously the experiences we're facing right now. In fact, people are boarding up because of the elections um, and everything that's transpiring. But moreover, you know, we just last night, um, yesterday, got extended the uh, alfresco order. So quite timely, this runs, uh, it aligns with uh, extending the hours to the point that was brought up from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. for dinner time purposes. Now people are gonna have to consider parking um, and paying for parking just to have dinner and so forth. So there are some concerns we have um, from, from hourly rates to the time that's been proposed. And you know, stated in the memo, quite frankly, it says while maintaining meter revenue is a priority, so is balancing the economic recovery of communities. And I just, and I thank you for stating that, Heather, um, you know, in that saying there, um, I just want to be mindful that we are in this together and this is going to be um, a pretty big uh, action that, that's going to be taken. So I, I think the outreach needs to be done. Tamiko brings up a good point. Um, there's many things here to consider and I just, I would offer up, perhaps we do postpone this for some time. Um, with everything given at this at this moment, it's just maybe not the right time. Sure, thanks, Nate. And I and that's that's one of the I mean that's the reason we're bringing this in a conceptual model to the board, right? Is to have a discussion around what your opinions are based on your particular expertise in your areas that you're um, you know on this board to represent. Um, we are trying very hard to walk that that, that line fine line of balance. You know, we have the, the businesses to consider and their relief and recovery and trying to balance between um, the downtown and what we've done in the downtown, um, in particular with that 90 minutes free, and how we can continue to help and provide relief um, in the exterior where they don't have that 90 minutes free. At the same time, generating something for the health of the parking fund. It's, it's, you know, there's multiple layers and things that we are trying to navigate through. And again, as everybody knows, this is, this is not any something, something that we've all done before and know exactly how it's gonna, gonna play out with from revenue perspective and to Charlie's point of not knowing, you know, what we're gonna have um, in the pot to make decisions based on. Um, we're trying to find ways to, to make all of those pieces fit together and balance to the best of our ability to kind of, um, meet all of our goals. So I appreciate immensely the discussion that's being here and I appreciate that you're being very forthcoming and, and um, clear in your various positions. It's, it's helpful for us to take the feedback and kind of go back and, and potentially modify things or if, if it's the board's desire to, again, leave it as is and not move on any kind of changes to what the current parking structure and rates are, um, we're, that's fine, that's, that's why we're here. Are the meters uh, is, on downtown, are, are they helping right now? Is Are the meters being on in downtown helping right now? Helping with what, what aspect? Helping the businesses. 
Well, it is. Um, downtown was, the, again, all these areas are different. So the one size fits all is, is not working any long. Um, the issues we were having kind of in downtown were more related to the, the meters being off and occupied and not being turned over. There's a lot of construction in the downtown areas right now. And we were finding that a lot of the construction workers were using that as, as their parking, their daily parking. So that was one of the areas. We wanna make sure that we're getting the turnover and those, those areas are available for um, businesses. So that was one of the key reasons we knew. Plus we were able to offer that, that 90 minutes. There was, there was you know, some layers of opportunity. Uh, this is Henry. I, okay. You know, I, I have in, in this whole discussion uh, and we're in this pandemic period, why, why wouldn't we have an appetite to suggest to the council to do a 50% reduction in current rates over some period of time, say the next nine months um, or even a year. So, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's my reaction to this whole discussion is, you know, versus an increase, why not there be uh, a subsidy in, in effect uh, to encourage all areas, downtown and, and exterior areas, to have a, re a cross the board reduction to counter the effects of the pandemic. And that's, that's part of, part of what the, the conceptual was, is a reduction to the dollar rate, which is a 50% reduction for Japantown and the exterior. No, 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 that was exterior areas only, yes. right? Correct. Right. Because because talking, again, the, the downtown about, has talking, the ninety minutes free. That was the balance. Not at a meter. Not at no, a meter. No, correct. In a in a parking garage. Well, we're talking about meters right now. Mm -hmm. David, you have a I question. Mean, I wanna... Yes. Could I make a couple of quick comments? Um, I'd like a map again of what areas are which around here. I don't know if they're the same as the map of the last one. But if somebody could email me a map, I'm a visual guy, so it helps me if I can see I where sent that the out. areas you're talking about are. The second thing is, of course, we appreciate that you have 90 minutes free in the garages. But as a retail business like ours, it used to be 30 cents for 120 minutes. So I guess I'd like to appreciate it if someone would recognize the fact that now if you say for 120 minutes, it's $4 and not 30 cents for our downtown retail validated old parking program. And I realize why you changed because that was a nightmare. And I worked through that with everybody, with Yvette and everybody at SP Plus. And we were able to get them to agree to a system whereby we didn't have to buy a $1,400 machine Anybody who bought that, I don't know what they're doing with them now. Maybe they're a doorstop. Um, so that's my first comment. Um, uh, the other one is, if I understand correctly, the goal of this is three things. And correct me if I'm wrong. One is to talk about starting meters that aren't on, which I guess is basically Japantown. The second one is to raise revenue, possibly by raising or lowering prices and also increasing the hours that you're in business. And then the third one is to give staff the flexibility without having to go back to the city council to, um, to adjust um, the rates uh, based on more dynamic thinking. Is that more or less accurate of the three things? Or I missed something. It, it is fairly accurate. Um, the second piece about just how it's hypothetically proposed, there is no increase in revenue. It's kind of it would maintain that as it's structured, it would it would maintain and potentially be a little reduction in revenue, but um, okay. for the, for the most part, so yes, you are you are from correct. A, just from a a, a um, understanding, as I guess I'm here partially as a small business owner downtown on a ground floor level between Market and First Street on West Santa Clara, where the business next to me burned down, the Verizon on the corner closed. And the City Bagels place right next door to me, I've been in to talk to her regularly. Her revenues are down 90%. And they have been since March 15th. And she's still open, although she's reduced her hours. 
Her clientele were the office people who would come in for breakfast and lunch primarily because she closed at three. So uh, please recognize that the businesses downtown are in a horrible state. And who knows how many of them will come back. And I think this is, this is like pricing any, this is like pricing a shirt. So what you're trying to do is decide what do, what do we price this meter for in order to have it occupied in such a way that, uh, that you maximize your revenue, frankly. And part of the maximizing the revenue is having somebody go into the shop. And so I think when you talk about occupancy, I'm not quite sure what you mean by occupancy, because when I walk out my front door and I walk to, to the uh, city hall, there's not a lot of occupancy on the street uh, between uh, Market and 4th Street. So um, uh, I guess that's more of a comment than anything that, um, I mean, if I was to make a motion, I would say table this whole issue until our September meeting and bring it back then. And that's for your own good, frankly, because as everybody's yep. telling you right now, um, this is not gonna play well in the uh, in in the media, for lack of a better word, and I can't I don't know why that people wouldn't be screaming at their city council members saying don't do this. So I'm not sure what the urgency is, but I agree that you should have some figure out a way to do dynamic pricing and all that. That's fine, but if you did dy dynamic pricing right now everything would be free and you just ticket the construction yeah. workers. And there's a ton yeah. of them park right in front of my space. I don't know how you do that. But I, had, I met with a developer the other day, a major developer downtown, and he said, I don't know why parking isn't free downtown. Well, I know why it's not free because then the office workers would be in it all day long and that wouldn't work for us either. So those are just like comments, I guess. But I think the goal of the, the metered parking is to attract people to downtown. And, and I think the thought process has to be, you're making money on meters right now. If it costs you $200,000 and, and 500,000 on top of that is going somewhere else, I guess, if I read those numbers correct, the 700 that comes in. And somehow you gotta figure out a way to think about how do we price the meters so people come downtown and people, mm -hmm. I've had, we've had tons of, we're soliciting people to come to our facility for, an, for about an hour, an hour and a half. Thank you for the 90 minutes, which is really only 70 because it takes you 10 minutes to get in the thing and to the business and then 10 minutes to get back. So your 90 is only really 70. I'm laying it out here, boys. I'm sorry. And, and uh, we've had tons of people say, I'm not coming because I can't park downtown. So we've, we've, we've lost a huge market for our product because of that. So just keep that in mind when you think about these things that pretend you're the business owner and you're saying, how can I price this so that we cover our costs, maybe make some money and give it to some other people, but focus much more on how do we get people to fill up? We want to fill up every meter right? All the time. And then we want to double the price because, because we're Rodeo Drive and everybody wants to come here. But we're not Rodeo Drive now. We're empty. Yep. And, and the trends in terms of ground floor retail are horrible throughout America. I mean, malls are closing and turning into, into uh, residential. So think about some of those things. I'm sorry, I talked too long. I'm done. But does that argument hold water given the fact that we would set the rates based on the occupancy at the meters? I, I mean, I get the, the argument, but- I'm talking about the occupancy in the businesses, not the occupancy in the meter. Well, if there's nobody in the meter, there would be nobody in the businesses, so the meter rate would go down. It's, I don't think it's a one-to-one. -one. I'm not it's sure. Not a one-to-one. Well, -one. Of course, I mean, I'm being a little generalistic there, but- well, I mean, explain that ultimate, I don't understand. Ultimately, you're not going to have a downtown that people will even want to come to after this is done. Like, we're, you guys now. are barely, you barely <laughs> holding on. Like, it's, it's disastrous. I mean, you I mean, know, it's just it's like it's 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 imagine. Um, can, oh, I make a, can I make a proposal? There's another, there's another I think that what I want to bring up. And uh, as a resident, you know, in the past, I had it that. I had contractors which I needed here to do some work on my place and their uh, contractor saying, I'm not coming because, you know, uh, parking in downtown is a mess. 
So you also have to think it's not just the businesses, it's also the residents. And if you ask a contractor to come out to my place <coughs> and pay, let's say, just $5 uh, per parking per hour for one hour, he will not come either, right? So it's not just the businesses, you also impact the residences. But to, to summarize what we all said, I think, you know, right now is not the right time. And I think we should move on and may, let me make the motion, uh, deny it for this uh, time and uh, bring it up in one year again. That would be my motion. I would propose you amend it and say, bring it back in September, because hopefully by next September, we should be in better shape. Okay, I can amend the, my motion for that. I'll second it. There's, All just to clarify, you're, you're talking about, just to clarify, point of clarification, you're talking about the con, con, conceptual model to change di, um, to more of kind of a dynamic, set up a dynamic pricing option uh, opportunity. That's the specific uh, no, motion we're, we're making. It, it, to take item 6B and postpone it until next September and bring it back then. That's what Correct. I would say. That is my motion. Take it. Rip up that memo so it never sees the light of day. Hold for uh, until September next year. And that and what, about ex what about the meter rates in the time being until yeah. next year? You can turn them on at any time, can't you? And just give people notice. Yeah, $2 an hour. Yes. I don't want the meters on in Japantown. <laughs> Where do you live, Tamika? <laughs> I live here. I, I live here. I work here. I have three businesses here. You know, and I, I challenge every single one of you. Where do you live and work? Would you want to represent your people properly too? So let me ask this, this question, Arian. When is the next board meeting? March. March. So that gives us about five months uh, time frame, right? So how about, you know, uh, you go back and to kind of rework this proposal with the inputs what we have. And we wait until turning the meters on until... Uh, you know, we have an another discussion in March. I think you, you guys have to come up with your, your recommendation and we will at staff level take it under advisement and then leave it up to, you know, the department to go forward with a recommendation. Either way, we need council approval for any changes to what exists on the books today, absent just turning them on. And uh, is there any timeline when we need to turn it on? Because I understand Tamiko has a, a kind of valid point. You know, the moment you turn it on right now in this COVID time, you may drive away businesses. Another proposal would be, can we turn it on with a reduced rate? Not without going to council. Maybe you need to go to council. You guys have a recommendation? So what is the current meter rate? It's $2? $2 per hour everywhere in the city, regardless of activity, regardless of occupancy. So $2 Tamiko, in a dead area, $2 in downtown. So Tamiko, let me ask you this question. What would be the, the pain level for Japantown to turn on the meters for reduced rate? Oh, it'd be, it's still massive. Uh, right now, like I, I don't, encourage pulling out the meters. I know that that's been a, a thing that several of the long-term business owners and residents have asked for since the 80s, that they want the meters out completely. I don't advocate for that because I understand that it, it, it assists with turnover. We are not at a place right now where that is needed. We definitely have cars coming and going all day long, but really the, the incentive of the, the free parking has been a lifesaver. Every business here is down minimum 50%. Every landlord here is offering rent at 50% or less. Everyone's taking a hit. If you start turning those meters on, we're gonna see a drop and a very angry um, constituent base of generally 60 to 80 year old Japanese Americans who lived through or descend direct descendants of internment. This really smacks of government interference in a way that I can't even uh, convey right now. Um, I don't like, I'm not pulling a card. It's not something that I like to, to tote, but you know, those are some very strong feelings. And that's how people feel about having things implemented on them by the government 
without their input or agreement. So is the city laid off uh, or furloughed or anything, any of the meter people that go around and uh, you know put tickets on cars when uh, they're a violation for uh, the time? Uh, enforcement crew? Yeah. Uh, no, we've not furloughed any, any okay. staff. So, so you got a full staff, you know. But they've been reassigned. But they, they do, yeah, There's they've been redeployed to help with COVID uh, uh, operations and other things. And they are also, they, they do more than just ticket in the downtown. They yeah. offer lots of services. So. All right, but, but can't you charge zero in these places, but have the enforcement folks come by and you put the sign up and you notify people that you, you got an hour to park or you got two hours to park or whatever the agreement is but after two hours, you get ticketed. So it's not unlimited time, so you can't have the construction guys there all day, but you have a, a, a two hour window and that way you get the turnover and you're using the people that you already have on staff. It's not like you're adding staff. Is that an option? It's an option. Um, it's uh, timed parking enforcement is extremely labor intensive. And again, they're prioritized elsewhere right now, but yes, that's an option. It's a $40 penalty for overstaying versus a dollar or two in meter fees. That sounds like okay, it's we have, for you, right? Let, let, me, let me try to help bring this full circle. We have a motion. Yep. And you, you want to state that motion Yeah, can again? you clarify what that motion is? What I've got written down is to pause the conceptual change in meter operations until at minimum September. Okay, is there a second? Second. That was David seconded it. So. Okay, call for the vote. Call for the vote. All in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, Aye. six. All right. And Henry. Yep. All right. Okay, we have hey, one David, last item. I have, item. To, I have oh, to go, I can't stay on any longer. All right, well, if you have to jump, I have one last item. It should take less than five minutes. If go I ahead, in September of 19, if I brought move, to the board. If I, a, a, Arian, if I leave, does that jeopardize the vote or do we have enough for a moment? Um, I think if okay. we have at least four people stay behind, okay. uh, th then we are good. Do we have four people staying? Five yeah. minutes, Shiggy, yeah. Run right. away, Harvard. Gotta go. Thank you. Okay. If, let, me, let me make it even quicker. If everybody here has read, read that memo, I would make an, um, a motion to support the staff position that these people owe the city the money under a holding agreement as they previously agreed to. So no, no support for an amendment. I don't want an amendment. It's not an amendment. I want to, my motion would be to retain the agreement as is. Leave it as is. Okay. Well, anybody else have an opinion or I do. Uh, sorry. Um, every is there every, everyone's got you know, rent reductions Let's, going on, you know, we're trying to be business friendly. Why don't we allow the parking staff to, the ability to negotiate with these folks to get something to keep them to continue to be a, a, a paying customer? Their, their development well, requires parking in order to continue to uh, satisfy the, their, their, permits and their CEQA clearance for the project. Um, so they want to retain the agreement and its ability to have future parking. They just want to uh, not, pay for it. not pay for the period of time under which there's litigation on the project. And so- And, and at this point in time, we're not involved in that uh, and they can proceed with their permitting process. As I understand it, yes. So again, do I have a second on a motion to 
support staff position? I'll second. Those in favor? Aye. Uh, show of hands in favor of leaving the agreement as is. One, two, three. Aye. Wolfram? Aye. Henry? Henry. Charlie? No. Against? I, 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 I think you're holding these guys to their agreement, but I think every resident and every business in downtown is renegotiating deals that they previously had during this pandemic. And I think they have the right to, you know, come back and ask for relief. Yeah, this isn't pandemic related. No, so. I, I understood. I understood it's not pandemic related, but it's things that I believe are outside of their control that someone's suing them. Um, so. Very good. Well, we've got the, we've got it noted. Are okay. Yep. Well, let me change my vote to to no as well. I I think you know Charlie has a good point here. All right. Okay. What's the vote? Four two to one. So the majority leave as is. And again, we have to take this to council. This will be noted in the council memo uh, with the with the vote, and the council will ultimately. Uh, give us direction on how to proceed. One question. Can they sure. walk away from this whole agreement? Theoretically, Theoretically, if they, as long as they got long-term 20 plus years of guaranteed parking in a private development somewhere to satisfy the, the city's parking requirements of the project, they could. I think it's slim to none in their ability to do that. So the city really backstop their ability, either that or they could change their plan and construct 41 parking spaces within their project, which based on the footprint and the cost, they would never do so. And remember, remember there's no one site parking. Correct. Right. So, um, Aaron, can we uh, close it out? We don't yep. need to. Uh, I don't, we will skip the remainder part. of the items and yeah. we will see you all in March and we'll forward out the uh, agenda and meeting details sometime in uh, February.